Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's learning session, a proxy for forest degradation using a spatial pattern analysis to identify potentially degraded forests organized by World Wildlife Fund's Forest and Climate Program. Thanks for taking the time to join us. My name is Breen Burns, and I'm a manager for communications based at our WWF offices in Washington, DC. Our presenter today is Orly Shapiro of WWF Germany, and she'll do a brief introduction of herself in just a few moments. This webinar is part of our monthly series in which we invite experts on forests, climate change, and red issues to share their expertise with us. So if this is your first time joining us, please know that we have more than 30 archived sessions you can watch online, or if you're a returning attendee, welcome back, and we're happy to have you. And before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics and some frequently asked questions. For those of you who have been here before, this will all look familiar, but the answer to our most frequently asked question is yes, today's presentation is being recorded and you can find the recording within a day or two on our YouTube channel. To get to the recording, just go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate or go to youtube.com slash climate. There are two audio options. You can listen via your computer or you can dial in through the phone numbers that were provided in your registration email. It's important to keep in mind that if you have audio difficulties while listening through your computer, this is sometimes caused by having too many software applications open or too many browser windows open. So feel free to close some of them and that usually solves the problem or you can always dial in. If you're having any technical difficulties, please send my colleague Jenny Guzman a message via the chat window and she'll try to help you out if possible. Questions are certainly welcome. You can send your questions to us using the toolbar on your screen um, and we will answer as many as possible during our allotted time. After the webinar, you'll receive a link in your follow-up email to our YouTube channel where you'll be able to find a recording of the session. And please, as a note, hold your questions until the end. We have a Q&A portion. We have plenty of time set aside for that. So thank you again for joining us. And with that, I'll get it started. And Orly, I will turn it over to you. And in just a moment, Orly, I will give you control. But please feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Orly Shapiro, and as Breen explained, I'm with WWF in Germany. And um, actually this uh, presentation today is also part of my doctoral dissertation, uh, which I'm doing with Humboldt University in Berlin. And uh, the, my research is focused on forest degradation, and today is basically presenting the first piece. Um, I envision it will have three components. Today is the simplest one. So if you're expecting me to solve the problem of forest degradation and you know, fix all of the issues you've been having with monitoring forest degradation, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I won't be doing that today. Uh, but what I'm going to do is basically explore this basic system we've, um, we've determined for allowing us to cover degradation. So here's a, um, an outline of my presentation. I'm going to start with a background and just telling you a little bit about what is forest degradation. And then I'm going to go into um, fragmentation, basically the goals of the study, um, a description of the methods, and then um, the research area is the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we performed an analysis at several scales, which I will show you the results of um, and the relationship it has to RED. And I will try to leave a lot of um, room for questions because I'm really looking forward to them. So next slide. All right, so I'd like to acknowledge um, my co-authors, um, Dr. Nikoa Aguilar Amusta Yeji from the Forest and Climate Program at WFUS, um, Dr. Hostert from Humboldt is um, my thesis advisor, and Jean-Francois Bastin has also um, contributed to the research, and um, we've also been using data from Dr. Satan Sachi um, at UCLA. So what do we know about um, greenhouse gas emissions and forests? Um, it's often been debated, but we know that deforestation is a significant contributor of greenhouse gas emissions, up to 20% of the global total. However, forest degradation, on the other hand, while 
can account for a wide um, amount of those degradations as well, those emissions, and they vary widely by continent, um, anywhere from, um, let me just go back, um, anywhere from 20%, um, sorry about that, anywhere from 20% to 60% um, percent for Indonesia or 50% for Africa. And, oh, I see my little thing. Give me just one second to make my screen bigger. Ah, yes, okay. So, um, so yeah, so the forest degradation is a, is a component of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but it ranges widely. And the reason for this um, variation estimates is because nobody really knows how much degradation um, is contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So what is forest degradation? Well, um, there's, it's important to determine the difference between deforestation and degradation. So deforestation um, is pretty much well defined. Um, it's basically been identified as a sustained decrease in crown cover. Um, and this is easily seen with remote sensing. You can see forests basically disappearing. And I think my slides are actually cut off, but I'll try to explain the diagrams in the bottom. But basically, if you look at deforestation and let's say related to carbon stock, you'll notice that uh, after deforestation, your carbon stocks go close to zero, or basically your, your biomass is removed. On the other hand, degradation um, doesn't really have a definition. Um, there's many definitions, and no one has really agreed upon them. Every country has its own definition. But in general, um, the definition includes something about a loss of ecosystem services while still having a change in, um, well, sorry, having no change in forest area. So that means that a forest can still technically be forest, but um, might have a lower delivery of ecosystem services when it's degraded. And often, this is a precursor to deforestation. So that means um, you might start with degraded forests, like in the second diagram, uh, that have biomass, and then you have an incremental decrease in biomass until you have eventually none if, if your area gets deforested. So um, more about degradation in ecosystem services. This is just showing you um, more of a graph of how your ecosystem services change with deforestation and degradation. So clearly deforestation has a more significant impact on your delivery of ecosystem services while degradation um, will have a decrease but won't be as significant. And degradation is known to affect um, carbon storage, water regulation, uh, biodiversity um, and resilience of forest ecosystems, um, things related to soil, and things related to livelihoods like non-timber forest products and a variety of cultural benefits. So these things are all affected. So what are the drivers of degradation? Well, particularly um, in Central Africa, we're focusing, um, but uh, these are applicable overall. But um, urban expansion is a common one. Roads and associated infrastructure result in forest degradation. Extraction of timber for industrial or local use. Uh, charcoal production and fuel wood, like in the photo to your right, um, which is very common in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then accidental or deliberate fires. People might um, clear forests. Um, for a particular area, that fire gets out of control, and often that can lead to degradation. So how is degradation measured for red? Well, there's a lot of proposed methods out there, including um, mapping some of these drivers, like I just discussed, maybe mapping roads, settlements, or fires. Sometimes um, there are some spectral mixing um, elements, which are really interesting, really great ways of um, interpreting satellite imagery and trying to you know, find that kind of hue um, of forest degradation. So there's a lot of work now with radar data, which is um, cloud penetrating and often um, can penetrate the canopy and give you an idea of forest structure. Um, and then there are more um, and more articles with buffering forest edges, um, similar to the Greenpeace um, Intact Forest Landscape um, um, project from Papatov et al. and then Haddad et al. Um, recently published a paper that buffered all the world's forests and um, did a great analysis on those um, ecological impacts. So that's more of a, I guess, a simplified spatial pattern analysis um, to identify forest degradation. Now the problem is that for RED or for um, these programs where we're trying to reduce emissions and monitor forests and try to look at the impacts on um, emissions, well, the problem is that a lot of these methods that we've just shown are the data is expensive or unavailable or costly. The processing, especially for something like spectral mixing or radar, will be really complicated. And often there's kind of no consensus. Um, there's really no way, reliable standard way to um, assess forest degradation. And sometimes it's actually just left out. 
and um, people decide to just not look at it for the RED program. And um, I'm going to show here that that can have actually some significant consequences um, in your emissions accounting. So, so let's talk about these forest fragmentation. Um, this is kind of the simpler method. So as I explained, part of my research um, will have three levels of analysis for forest degradation. The first one that I'm tackling is more of this simpler spatial analysis. And this figure here is from the Haddad et al. article. And it shows the basically a, um, a meta-analysis of all of the impacts of these different types of changes in forests. Um, such as like a reduced area or isolation of forest patches or increases in edge, edge. So just an example on the figure on the right, you don't have an overall change in forest area, but you do have an increased amount of edge. And this is important to consider because you might be monitoring your forest for red and your forest area is not changing, but you do have a lot of effects of edge that will affect your productivity, community composition, microclimates, and so on. And I think this is what we're really trying to tackle when we look at forest degradation, because you might not have so much of a change in forest area, but you're going to have a change in forest quality or what type of, what type of ecosystem services your forest is delivering. So the goals of this study, um, and generally overall, are to provide robust, repeatable methods for RED, specifically for RED. Um, WWF is involved in a lot of emissions reduction programs, and so we like to have a toolbox available to help us um, assess degradation. In addition to that, we also perform uh, evaluation for WWF. We monitor um, our projects and programs worldwide, and we often need to know how we're doing. And we call those KPIs, or key performance indicators. And, for, and similar to how we do with RED, we need to know in our project ecoregions, you know, is, is deforestation decreasing? Are our conservation projects um, having an impact, and you know, are we are we being successful in our goals? So that's the kind of two-pronged approach here for the goals for our audience for this um, assessment. Finally, I wanted to uh, basically overall is to assess the amount of degradation versus deforestation and the related emissions, which is a really important um, idea to tackle. And then in the meantime, trying to figure out how can we measure degradation? It needs to be defined and analyzed. And then what type of spatial resolution or data or methods can we um, employ to map degradation? And then eventually, this research will go into determining what are the factors. Are they really infrastructure, agriculture, or are there other things um, that are more important than others? So like every research, there's a lot of challenges here. Um, and one of them mainly, um, and the challenge in mapping and monitoring forest degradation is that while well, these, these uh, methods have to be well defined with limits of confidence, limits of accuracy, that's sometimes difficult to achieve. Um, a method needs to be reproducible, so it can't be something that happens in a black box or only I can do, but it needs to be something that I can share with my colleagues or with other people and also repeat over time in order to assess change. It needs to be cost efficient like many, like many methods and practical. And we want something that is comparable, standardized, repeatable, transparent, all of these things um, that are a part of RED. Um, and of course, as WF, as an NGO, we have limited funds and time. You know, I can't spend five years uh, you know, just researching this one thing. We need things that are really effective and efficient and robust. So this is a lot to, to ask for, but let's just see um, how far we get. So the methods employed um, were basically this. So um, I took that concept of forest fragmentation and I developed it at two scales of analysis in the DRC, which I will show you um, soon. And then um, within those fragmentation classes, I sampled above ground biomass um, for a random set of points, and I tested the differences in above ground biomass between these classes. Um, and we basically compared, yeah, above ground biomass in different types of fragmentation or edges. And then um, I analyzed this over time for the national scale for all of DRC, and then tried to calculate the emissions related to this. So the method employed is um, nothing new. It's been around quite a while. It's called um, Morphological Spatial Pattern Analysis, MSPA for short. And you might have seen um, a lot of publications by Soil and Volk. And actually, there's a software out there from um, the European Space Agency called Guidos. And it essentially performs this. Um, and what it does is it's based on geometric concepts can be applied at any scale and has been um, published in a number of articles. 
um, and we are using it widely for our program monitoring. And essentially, um, it is a pro it's what we call a matrix approach to monitoring. And Buki et al. published a paper on how, uh, basically addressing how countries with limited resources, so that don't have a lot of money to address to monitoring, how can they kind of easily tackle the idea of degradation? And so Buki came up with this matrix approach, which is essentially looking at, you know, the changes from natural intact forests to non-intact forests and assigning them um, different categories based on their positions in the tables. And one of the things they used was this morphological spatial pattern analysis. Now, um, so I explored the Guido's toolbox. It's great. It's, it's free to download. Um, it's open source. You can use it. The only problem that I had with it is that, well, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's so large, it actually um, surpassed the data um, limits for, this, um, for Guido's. And I had some issues with it, and I wanted something that I could really break apart and um, mess with the algorithm myself and tailor it myself. So what I did is I took um, the exact concept from uh, those soil invoked articles and basically assigned, um, using those same concepts of MSP, I, designed, I assigned four types of fragmentation. And those are core forests, so it um, makes sense kind of interior forest that's, that's intact and consistent and has no holes. Then we have something called inner edge, which is basically an inside edge um, of forest, which I'll show you what that looks like. Outer edge is an area of forest that borders on a large area of non-forest. And then we have patches that are basically these small little pieces of forest that are most likely most degraded. And I classified these into a level of degradation, as you see on the column on your right. So core forest is clearly has the lowest degradation, whereas these small patches um, will have the highest amount of fragmentation and degradation. And what does that look like? Um, theoretically here, we have a forest, non-forest map on your right, I'm sorry, on your left. The green represents forest, the white is non-forest. And when you run it through the algorithm, it produces the following. So you have your core forest is maybe your consistent areas in the middle. Um, that little inner edge, that little opening hole in the middle is, is the inner edge. We have the outer edge and then the patch forest, which falls below some threshold of core forest. And you give it some parameters which are basically the window size or the width of your edge, or basically how far in um, from, a, you know, from the edge do you have core. So that little red area um, is basically there's no core for it because nowhere is far enough from the edge to be core. That's basically what this produces. So let's talk just really quickly about the Democratic Republic of Congo and why we chose this as an area. Um, it's located in Central Africa, has the largest tract of tropical dense forest in Africa, um, as you can see with the map on your right, it's more than one million kilometers squared of tropical moist forest. So it's quite a sizable area to study. Um, like I said, the data um, that we were inputting into Guidos was just, uh, um, it surpassed the limits. We're talking about very large data sets. And we're also talking about a country that probably has very limited resources for monitoring. Um, we kind of need some really easy ways to, to map degradation or to at least get an idea of what's happening. Um, there's a definitely uh, effects of scale in the in the DRC, and that little dot, um, the little polygon on on the red and the right map is actually the it's a new province of Mine Dombe, and it's um, an area where there's a lot of red activities going on and a lot of monitoring and um, and plots and projects, um, also with WWF. And so I just wanted to point that out because that's where um, our focal study takes place. So to test um, the effect of fragmentation or whether this fragmentation um, proxy or algorithm really works, there are two scales of analysis. And one of them is on a local scale, so it's a small area um, in that red polygon near a study area that we have, which we call Malevo, where a lot of WF activities are taking place. And we um, have a 15 meter resolution forest cover data set, which we acquired from airborne LIDAR um, as part of another project that we are doing to map biomass. So we have, um, we basically define forest cover as anything greater than five meter canopy height. And then we're using um, that LIDAR data, we also have derived biomass. Um, and so we have 100 meter um, resolution biomass data that is also calibrated by field data, um, that we have very good field data in that particular little column. So um, for that local scale, we're doing um, what we're calling a window size of seven. Uh, I, showed you in the previous slide, slide what the parameters for the fragmentation analysis are. You give it this edge. And we gave it seven, which is basically relates to a minimum mapping unit of one hectare, which is relevant to, to red activities. 
And then for the national scale, you have about 2 million kilometers squared total. And this is using a 60 meter forest cover data set um, from Popatov, also called the SPACET. Um, I resampled it to 100 meters um, to make it more on par with the one hectare um, minimum mapping unit. And also um, the biomass data that we have um, to assess the biomass of the new different classes is from the Saatchi et al. paper from 2011, which is about 900 meters. So you can see the two different effects of scale here. We just don't have better biomass data on a national scale. Um, and this um, analysis then had a window size of nine um, to create an MMU of basically one kilometer. So basically the window size is on the same resolution as the biomass map in both scales of analysis. And this is what the results look like um, for a small portion of the local scale analysis. What you have on the left is a airborne LIDAR image, um, 10 centimeter photo, um, which shows you some forest, some variations in forest, and a little clearing up on the top left. Um, that data is then processed by Sachi at UCLA, and it gives you a mean canopy height. As you can see the clearings are very low canopy, up to about um, the highest ones are about 40 to 50 meters. We threshold that and say everything above five meters is forest on forest, and I run it through that algorithm that I showed you, which gives you the core, inner edge, outer edge, and patch um, of, of, that, of that spot. And then I overlay it with the above ground biomass, and I basically sample the biomass within each of those classes, each of those four classes. And the results show that um, the biomass, uh, the mean biomass is statistically significant, is much higher in the core um, category than the inner, outer edge, and patch. And those means in each of those categories decrease, and they're all significantly different. Um, while there still might be some overlap, the ANOVA um, statistical tests show that the means are uh, significantly different between all classes. And we're finding here that um, as kind of expected, the biomass is decreasing with the increasing degradation class. So your patchy forests that are all these little bits on um, the forest there have much lower biomass than your core. So if we're thinking about this degradation and, um, and being related to carbon stock, we're actually seeing that there's a pattern to the forest biomass and that the core forests have more biomass than the edges, which is as expected. Um, but it just came out statistically significant, which is very interesting. And Oh, and just to show you, the mean biomass is listed above every polygon. So the mean biomass for that, for that area um, in mine domain is 214 um, tons per hectare, and it goes down to 14 for the patches. And at the national scale analysis, I ran this on the national map, we have um, similar results. Um, the core is much higher biomass of the mean is significantly different from the inner edge, which is slightly lower, um, and then slightly lower more is the outer edge and then the patches. Model was significant, and um, you might be wondering what the difference in biomass estimates are between the local and the national scale, and that's mostly due to resolution. We have a 900 meter uh, biomass map versus a 100 meter biomass map, and so you're averaging over a larger area, and so clearly you'll get a lower biomass overall. But still, we're showing that the, that the um, MSPA is actually picking up now significant differences in biomass, which can be really helpful to your REDD program. So what, ha what did I did? So I ran that fragmentation analysis then on these three um, time, um, these basically three times of forest cover, which we have from the FACET data. Um, FACET has forest cover in 2000, 2005, and 2010. And so I ran the algorithm on those three years. And then I started to look at the change, because now I can also use this um, algorithm as kind of a, a way to look at change over time. And I'll show you that a little bit more in the next slide, but here just to show you basically the amount of core, inner edge, outer edge, and patch forest in each of those three time periods. And overall, you can see the core forest, which is over 70% in the first time period, decreases to about 68% um, in the second time period. Now keep in mind that uh, these areas are all defined as forest in that facet map, but now what we're doing is de defining more areas here that are degraded. Um, so this is a way of really identifying, yes, the potentially degraded areas of forest that, that are still technically um, ident being identified as forest. And so and you can see at the same time your forest cover is decreasing, as we know, um, but we look at the percent of the total core and edge categories um, over time. And this is what WWF is using to um, monitor our major programs in the Amazon and, and uh, Southeast Asia and all over the world. 
um, using this core forest percentage kind of as an indicator to study over time. So I showed you that there were three different time periods um, with the forest and the fragmentation. And now, when you look at one pixel over time, based on the pixels that are the forest that's changing around it, you know, a forest will become basically, it can go from being on the core to an edge forest, or it can go from core to inner edge. And there's all these different possibilities of transitions. And um, I've showed you these transitions in this, in this diagram. So if we look at the core forest, which let's say has the most biomass down to the non-forest, and that's what that triangle represents. If you look at the different transitions, transitions between pixels, we can try to identify them and give them a kind of trajectory. So sort of like that matrix approach I showed you in the beginning that shows maybe intact forest to non-intact forest, now we can actually use these four categories and give you a little bit more information on the types of changes that a forest is undergoing. So something that goes from core to non-forest is clearly deforestation, right? That's primary deforestation. That's a, that's a core forest that's intact and that's the deforested. But something that goes to these different edge types is called primary degradation because it starts with core and then goes to these other edge types. Something that starts in maybe these edge types and then goes to different types of um, other types of degradation, we also call that secondary degradation. And that's really important because it just shows you the subsequent steps um, that a forest can undertake in degradation, that it doesn't just stay degraded, but it can move. It can go to a more degraded state, or um, it can also recover, as you can see on the right. So there's a lot of dynamics now that we can study with this really simple algorithm and basically see um, these different types of deforestation and degradation. And if you put that on a map, so put all of those um, trajectories or those transitions of each pixel on a map, you can actually see now on this map between 2000 and 2010 what is the intact forest that hasn't changed. It's the core forest over both all the time periods. And then um, things that are degraded and maybe stay degraded, so they stay in the same class. And then those different types of trajectories that I just showed you, the secondary degradation, secondary deforestation, primary um, degradation and deforestation, and also regeneration. So an area um, might, might change classes. It might be an outer edge and then become an inner edge, and so it's less degraded. So now we can look really into more depth and the more um, detail what's happening to Congolese forests, where um, are these areas being degraded. And just in this example, I show you one area near North Kivu, um, which is a known deforestation hotspot. And yes, you see a lot of um, deforestation, but also a lot of primary degradation. So a lot of, um, a lot of core forests in one year are, are changing to these edges um, or patch forests in, second, in the subsequent years. And then I showed you a differing area in northern Bandudu province, um, which shows you just a little bit of the more mosaic um, forest we have with um, very small patches of deforestation and degradation in this forest of Anna Mosaic. So now we have a good, pretty nice idea of how um, these forests have been changing over a 10-year period. And this can be um, updated with additional forest cover, clearly, um, as it becomes available. And um, we can summarize um, these results maybe by province. And this is an example showing you the percentage of core, inner edge, and outer edge, and patch um, in all of the different provinces. And so showing you something like the Kinshasa province, which doesn't have much forest to begin with. It's all degraded. Um, you know, and then somewhere like Katanga actually also does not have a lot of forest, but let's say it's more um, stable around the right. And then you can see the increases um, in the different um, categories of fragmentation over time in Tsukivu, um, Maniema, and so on. Now remember that each of these categories actually, um, you know, the green represents statistically higher biomass um, than the smaller types, and so, um, sorry, than the more fragmented types, and so we can start to think about what types of emissions might be happening um, due to these changes. And, um, and that's exactly what I did. So using the uh, mean biomass in those categories, I did a simple you know, gain-loss method and basically um, figuring out how many hectares were lost from deforestation and degradation and, and how, many, um, how much biomass that represented per hectare. I just did the calculation. And so um, I can show you also in these 
this is interesting to contrast these, contrast these two time periods, um, 2000, 2005, and 2005 to 2010, um, because as you see, you know, deforestation increases from one time period to the next slightly, but the degradation actually goes up um, a lot. And that's because you might have changes within degradation categories. And so a lot of other papers, um, including some out of the University of Maryland folks that um, just identify degradation, let's say as a buffer or as an impact for its landscape, but they don't, you can't, they don't really monitor what happens in those degradation classes. And that's why um, this becomes more interesting with these four categories. So you can look at the changes of deforestation and degradation over time, and also the associated biomass loss. So very simple calculations, just take the kilometer squared, how much we lost and how much biomass that represents. And you can see, let's say in the first time period, you might have a lot more um, biomass loss from deforestation because you're losing a lot of core forest and maybe not a lot of degradation, but those emissions really jump up in the second time period. Um, and that results in a lot of CO2. In fact, even um, almost as much um, emissions or CO2 from degradation as deforestation on a national scale um, in the second time period. Um, and this is showing you the last row shows you basically the, the percentage of emissions related to deforestation and degradation. Um, and so that huge jump is really significant. And so the point, the take home message here is that degradation, you know, as, as coarse and as rough as its um, calculation is, degradation could potentially be producing a lot of emissions. And currently, we don't really monitor them, or we don't include them in a red um, program. And so we could be missing out on a lot of additional emissions. And um, just the pattern of, of deforestation we see in Africa, it's not the, the large scale deforestation like you see in the Amazon or Indonesia. You do have a lot of the smaller um, deforestation, which can result in a lot more degradation. Um, and as we've noticed here in the second time period, a lot more um, degradation in the latter five years than the earlier five years, and that these degradation emissions are they're quite significant. Um, and you can get almost up to half of the total emissions um, over the time period are, are between these degraded states. And that's um, back to that transition graph. This is showing you that you know something goes from an inner edge to an outer edge, and that can result in emissions. And so. Um, these kinds of changes and these transitions really need to be considered um, when one has a, a red program or a monitoring program. So the conclusions here are that um, basically what we've shown is that forest biomass um, in the DRC has a spatial pattern and we can use that to monitor forests over time. So intact forests um, in the center and the core have higher biomass than these more degraded states which you find on the edges. Um, and this is substantiated by a lot of the literature that explains the effects of edges um, on forests um, that affect climate, you know, different colonizing species and so on. Um, also, a particular interest here in the Congo is that, um, let's say, patchy or edges are more accessible by humans, and so people are more likely to degrade them even more. Um, and so that's why this is so um, important to map. Um, we've also shown that the forest degradation and the emissions are, in fact, potentially significant. And we can't just continue to monitor just forest cover, um, but we really should look at the pattern of forest. Um, and this goes back to, you know, some basic concepts of conservation biology, where, you know, just one intact forest is um, a lot better than 100 tiny forests. Um, and so this could also have potential impacts on your safeguards and your biodiversity safeguards, where um, these low, these edges and these fragmented forests are probably going to have lower biodiversity because um, they're more accessible, um, they have different microclimates, and so you're probably going to see those impacts, um, you know, in your associated uh, biodiversity. Um, and what this does is this is supporting basically what we're calling a tier one of these low-cost methods for monitoring. This method is the simplest uh, there is, you know, it's easy to run, um, anybody can kind of understand it, and this is kind of what I think or what, what we agree is like your basic level of monitoring. So at a minimum, you should try to um, get an understanding of your forest with something like this before maybe you have LIDAR or really more detailed methods or, you know, super high resolution data or something like that that could help you more um, directly measure degradation. 
but I think these low cost methods, these simple methods do have value. Um, and we've shown that the, the biomass is significantly different. And so, um, you know, this can be easily integrated into monitoring schemes. Um, and next, and how do, like, what does this mean for RED? Well, um, you know, as I explained, the method is repeatable. You can run it on subsequent years and you can keep all your parameters the same so it's consistent over time. Um, it's very cost effective, meaning that it's basically a free model. Um, anybody can run it. Um, it's quite simple. Um, minimal parameters to uh, input, and it's also free to download. I have a ArcGIS model um, that I have posted um, on our ArcGIS online site, uh, which anybody um, can access. I can share the link with you, and you can basically run it on yourself. Um, of course, uh, there are some caveats, and that is um, that it's highly dependent on the forest cover map. So, um, you know, we are assuming that the forest cover map that we have is good. Um, the one for the LIDAR, we assume is very good for forest cover. LIDAR can, um, can determine what is forest. Um, and the Landsat data is pretty good um, for DRC, but in places where you don't have a good forest cover map, that will affect uh, your results. Um, however, if you are monitoring an area for red and you are you know, mapping, you will have a forest cover map. Um, so all you need really is a binary forest cover map. Um, you still need, um, you know, emissions factors and improved accounting methods, um, you know, for to doing specifically red, um, you know, to, to actually calculate those emissions. Um, however, even without the emissions factors, you can still look at your transitions and how much, uh, you know, changes in degradation states uh, you are getting. Um, and of course, as always, you know, this can always be improved by locally derived methods. So if you do have LIDAR or, you know, people on the ground or other ways of mapping, you know, canopy cover or things like that, you can always improve um, the system this way. Um, but just as an aside, I did test this also on an Amazon-wide forest cover map, and we had very similar results. And so I think um, it can be exported um, to a number of other places. It's really, as long as you have a good forest cover map, you can easily identify what is edge, what is patches, and so on. And for WWF, what we're mostly interested in um, is monitoring core forests over time. So we think that, you know, protecting these core forests is really important. And that's um, something that this enables that for us. Um, and that concludes the presentation. I hope that wasn't too long. Um, and I'd like to uh, open the floor for your questions. Thank you, Orly. So to kick us off, the first question we have is, can we assess the impacts from logging with this method? And Orly, you still have screen control, so if you need to um, jump back to any slides, you should be able to if, while you're answering questions, just so you know. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of people ask me about um, logging, and that's a, um, an interesting question in the DRC. A lot of the logging is very selective. Um, and elsewhere it could be selective. And so um, if your logging is not apparent in your forest cover map, so for example, um, th then you won't see the effects of logging. And that's unfortunately the drawbacks of this method is that I, I can't tell you whether an area has been logged. Maybe if there's roads through that area or there's logging roads and, and um, I have that in my forest cover, I can see those edges, then I'll be able to tell you, you know, how much of those ro um, edges have been degraded due to roads. But this is not a direct, um, you know, um, monitoring method like spectral mixing or radar data that really helps you detect, you know, um, areas that are logged in the middle of the forest. Thank you. So the next question is from Jacob, and Jacob asks, how did you calculate biomass? Did you use height as a proxy for biomass? Did you obtain average estimates for a certain forest type or size and then extrapolate from there. And also, Orly, if you can speak a little bit more slowly and a little okay. bit louder, that would be great. Okay. Um, yeah, so I can go back. Um, I did lose control. Or, um, <clears throat> so for the biomass, um, so the local scale analysis, the biomass was analyzed directly from LIDAR. Um, and that was developed by UCLA, um, which is a calibration approach um, that takes known biomass from plots and then derives what's called a LIDAR allometry. And so using the height information from the LIDAR um, determines a biomass. And all that I did for these um, calculations was very simple. It was just to calculate average biomass in these categories um, basically based by a sampling approach. 
So the biomass map from the LIDAR was a continuous biomass map, and you sample it, and then you get these mean biomass per category, like you see in this, um, in this figure. And for the national scale analysis, I used the biomass from Saatchi. Um, so that's that published global benchmark biomass map. I take random samples in each of my classes, and I estimate an average. So it's very simple. Thank you. So the next question is, can this be run on the Hansen forest cover change data? And perhaps you can give a quick background on the Hansen forest cover change data in case anybody isn't familiar with that. The Hansen, uh, that's the Google forest cover change data, um, which is a global analysis with Landsat data. And um, you know, you can run it on any forest cover map. What you would need to do is derive a forest cover map from the Hansen data. Um, the Hansen data are um, what's called the vegetation con vegetative continuous field, VCF, and it basically, for the whole world, gives you a value from 0 to 100. 0% 0 forest to 100% tree cover. And so if you know the threshold for your area, you can basically derive your forest cover map for 2000. And then you take the gains and losses that they provide in the separate data set, and you basically remove forest, add forest, and you can make your forest cover map for 2000, 2010, or 2013. And all you need is this binary uh, forest cover map. My model runs on a raster that has one value of 1 for forest and a value of 0 for non-forest. And so that's um, all you need. So any source, any reliable source for forest cover um, We'll let you run this in an algorithm. Thank you. So we have also had a couple of questions about how the distances for inner and outer edges and patch sizes were determined. So can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, and so, for example, um, the GOFC G GOLD sourcebook uses one kilometer distance as a general rule for intact slash non-intact forest. Exactly. So. Um, for our global um, analyses and even the national stuff, we use about a one kilometer um, edge distance, specifically also from that same source. In the literature, it varies between um, one to two kilometers. And I did a test um, that's not shown here, but I, I tested all these different window sizes. And basically, as soon as you get to the size of your biomass, um, that's when your results make sense, and that's clearly showing that the biomass, clearly you can't estimate, you can't uh, do an analysis that works with biomass that goes below the resolution of your biomass map. So for simplicity, um, we took a, um, and I'm trying to go back here, we took a um, window size that was basically related to the biomass map. And so in the local scale case, that was 100 meters, so the window size um, was Seven. And then in the uh, national scale, which had that 900 meter biomass data, the window size was nine. Um, but those are related to the pixel size. So we have a 60 meter, uh, sorry, we have a 100 meter forest map. A window size of nine means about a one kilometer window, 900 meters. And in the local scale, um, we had a 15 meter data with a window size of seven, results in one hectare. Um, but it can be, um, that's one of the parameters in the model, and I have it set up that the inner and outer edge distances can be run differently. So you can have a bigger outer edge than a uh, distance than an inner edge, as you wish. Um, but that's how we decided it for this analysis. Thank you. So the next question is from Andrea, and Andrea asks, have you analyzed the impact of the accuracy of Saatchi's map in addition to the impact of its course resolution? Yeah, so um, we know that um, every biomass data has uncertainty, and we know that this 900 meter biomass map does have uncertainty, and it actually comes with an uncertainty layer, but um, it's really hard to determine accuracy because we don't have data for most of these forests. Um, even the plot data that exists currently in the DRC is from very restricted areas, and we simply um, don't know the biomass in most of these areas. So this was just using the um, best available source. Um, however, we are running a project called the Carbon Map and Model Project in the DRC um, that is actually developing a national scale biomass map for um, the DRC um, from, from plot data, airborne LIDAR, and satellite imagery. And when that map comes out, 
um, then we can clearly look at that we have a better idea of accuracy, of local accuracy um, and uncertainties, and we'll definitely compare that former global map, which was based on data that isn't even in the DRC, um, with this particular map, and then we can see how the, that, um, how the results change. So the next question is back to our popular topic of window size. Um, so Claudia asks, how do you choose the window size, which in turn affects the edge width, and is it related to the forest patch sizes? Yeah, so um, yeah, so as I explained, um, for this case, we used a window size that was related to the resolution of the biomass map, um, but it can be done um, on, on anything. I mean, um, like someone just brought up this uh, one kilometer recommendation. Um, I mean, if your project size is really small, you can basically you know, determine your window size based on your expert knowledge, local knowledge. Um, but in this case, um, we used, we, we wanted to stick to something that we could say, okay, it was the resolution of the biomass map. Um, and then on the national scale, it relates to what's been published in literature, which is always between about one and two kilometers. Thank you. The next question, how well does this method do in areas where deforestation occurs in larger patches? A good question. Um, well, um, it all depends on what your deforestation looks like. If you have large areas of forest disappearing, um, you know, and you aren't, kept, you don't see those. Basically, they disappear in your forest map. Then, um, well, you won't have any degradation there. You'll basically have your edges. Um, so it really depends on. It all comes down to what is your kind of edge to area ratio, or how many edges are you having. Um, but big chunks of forest which disappear, um, they, yeah, they, won't, they won't be there anymore and you can't identify the degradation. Um, but what's interesting is um, some of the work we've been doing in the Mekong um, is pretty interesting because we made, um, we did some fragmentation maps with some really old data and then we looked at where deforestation actually happened and um, it, deforestation was, or clearing was way more common in these patches and these edges. Obviously, um, they're more um, affected, um, but clearly, yeah, we see patches disappear much faster um, than core areas, and so yeah, that shows just a lot of the complexity of what's happening. You know, a few trees is going to be a lot easier to clear than you know than uh, these huge, large, uh, you know, old stands of forest. And so, if people are clearing for land or whatever, they'll they'll probably cut down these little um, tiny bits of forest. So the next question is long, so bear with me as I read it slowly. This is from Will. When translating changes in above ground biomass to CO2 emissions, how do you account for the fact that some biomass loss might have been the result of burning or other activities with direct emissions, whereas some biomass extraction might have been for using wood in construction, et cetera? So maintaining yeah. carbon storage of that biomass. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the carbon accounting we employed was very simple. It's not um, to be submitted for any red reporting, but it was just to show um, the changes in those different, those mean classes. Uh, but clearly a more detailed accounting will account, yes, will account for uh, litter, um, you know, root biomass and all of these things. Um, we just looked at uh, the above ground biomass and those kind of mean areas in these different types of forests. So we're calling types of forests, but they're actually different uh, levels of degraded forests. Um, and so, yeah, that's not considered here, but clearly for a, a more detailed project or a red reporting, that would have to be considered. So the next question is, do you have an explanation for the decrease in deforestation coinciding with an increase in degradation? And I don't know what slide. Great question. So that's basically what it comes down to is I think that um, you won't, really be seeing, let me see if I can just find a nice map here, is that, you know, what we find is that you might not see in the DRC, you know, these huge clearing forests, these big, um, these kind of big areas being uh, disappearing, but what you'll probably see over time um, is a lot of activity related around uh, cities, and we, I'm trying to find this map. Um, yeah, so in these center areas, you see a lot more degradation kind of in this cuvette central and around these towns and kind of radiating out um, from these cities. And I think that's what we're seeing is, um, if you look at the forest cover map, it picks up these kind of little roads and little things that go in and these, basically these activities that are increasing the edges. 
and we're not seeing, you don't see huge areas of clearing in the DRC with the exception um, of these areas in the east. But for example, in the Mayan Dombe in the west, you'll see a lot of this tiny, um, it's basically, it's a lot of slash and burn. Um, it's a lot of, you know, local, small scale activities um, that I think are contributing to this type of deforestation. Um, the DRC is referred to as what's a high forest, low deforestation country, meaning that it has a high forest cover but a low rate of deforestation. Um, I believe it's less than 1%. So we're not going to see the kind of clearing that you see in Indonesia related to oil palm plantations and so on um, just yet. But right now it's much of these kind of smaller activities. And all those do is they increase, increase edges and they leave these little patches which is what we're measuring here. So the next question is, do you have any quantitative clue about the drivers of degradation using factors such as mining, logging concessions, proximity to villages and roads? And I would think this person means in the DRC case that you presented. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there has been a lot of research in the DRC um, about deforestation, or sorry, degradation drivers. Um, there was a report released last year um, by a Congolese doctoral student, and it was related a lot to fires, um, a lot to small scale agriculture, and in the um, extremely related to charcoal um, and uh, these clearing for uh, for fuel wood. Um, the capital city um, has over 10 million people, and most of them cook with charcoal. They don't have electricity. They don't have alternative sources of fuel wood. And that is driving um, huge amounts of deforestation around the capital. Um, and you see that all over. And so, and yes, that, that's what the, um, as I explained in the beginning, the different tiers of this analysis will, um, will eventually lead back to maybe a better refinement of these drivers. Um, but in the DRC, we, we know what, um, what they are. And they're different in different provinces. Um, but it's, it's so far not, you know, no large industrial oil palm or clearing um, but it's very um, selective logging industrially and then these kind of small scale um, impacts. Huge population increase, um, lots of people living in these rural settings um, with very little infrastructure um, and they depend on the forest for their livelihoods and so that, that's what um, we're seeing. Thank you. And then next question is from Jeremy and Jeremy asks, or Jeremy says, it seems that in addition to being very dependent on forest cover, this algorithm also defines degradation classes based on morphological parameters. Are these distances or parameters defined in the model for edge and core? Um, so the morphological um, categories come from the original article from uh, Soil and Vogue, and those are um, they're defined geometrically, basically. So um, it's like a window analysis. So if a forest pixel is surrounded entirely by other forest pixels at its core, um, and those different um, those different types of categories are basically a bunch of geometric uh, relationships, and it looks at um, kind of a uh, little bit. It's, it's a standard assessment. It's morphological spatial pattern analysis. If you look up MSPA, you'll find a lot of the information on it, which is these basically these logical steps that look at edge, that look at core, and then look at all the core areas that are below a certain size, those become patched, um, and so on. And so that's how those are defined. And um, so that, that's how the scale basically drives what that is. And then, um, but in the model, you can play with that edge distance, and then you can say, all right, my edges are five kilometers, you know, from the non-force edge. And so then you can have, you know, more, um, more categories like that. Um, but those names of the categories also, that, those came directly from um, those previous papers, and that's what uh, they define. And the Guido's tool um, defines additionally a bunch of other categories like bridges and loops and links and all these other types of degradation that can also be very useful. So it's, it's all based on the spatial pattern. Thank you. And we've had a couple of questions. Um, people are asking for the link to download the algorithm. So I'm going to advance. Um, to the slide where orally, I believe we have this link and post it, yeah, um, but um, it's this one right at the top. Yeah, well, I have it on. Um, it's on Globeal. I have okay. to see if it's searchable. But I basically uploaded a geo processing service to our ArcGIS online site, and it should be public. Um, 
it's a really kind of long, complicated link, and I didn't know how it would work if you don't have a login to ArcGIS Online. I'm not really sure how it works. Uh, but you're more than welcome to email me and ask me for the model, and I will I can email it to you. It's very small, or I can show you where the link is. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you have any bugs or ways to improve it or think it's terrible, um, love to hear your opinion. Thank you. And Orly, if you would like, um, I can include the link if you send it to me, I can include it in yeah, the we'll yeah. follow-up email, or you can also copy and paste it into the chat box if you want to try that as well to all participants. Yeah, I can try. My, my one problem is that I center on this link, and then I'm going to get 100 responses of people like, oh, you don't have a login. Um, so I just have to see um, how how I can download it, because I just, I just posted it a couple of days ago. OK. Um, but I will send it, um, yeah, I'll send it to you when you send around the recording. Absolutely. And we have a few more questions here. So the next one is from Felix, and Felix asks, would this method be applicable to assess forest cover and biomass loss as well as CO2 emissions caused by droughts, storms, and other climate or weather extremes? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, once again, as this basically is just an interpretation of a forest cover map, you know, if that forest cover map shows you mortality from trees or um, dead trees, then yeah, you could basically see that. Um, but for something like that, I would probably recommend more direct methods of remote sensing, like identifying dead trees and, and so on, looking at those impacts. But this runs on a forest cover map. So if you have a good forest cover map, then, then that's how you run it. Thank you. The next question from Karen. Karen asks, at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that driver's analysis was part of the study. Can you please speak a bit about how the degradation analysis was conducted? Um, you're talking about the driver's analysis. So the driver's analysis was from this um, other published study. Um, and that's what we know um, the drivers of degradation are. Um, but, if, but this is um, basically the first step in the research. And the next step is to take the information here from these, um, what we know about these uh, degraded areas, and do a spatial analysis of where are cities, where are roads, um, and things like that to kind of get more information on the spatial patterns of degradation. But we've, we've done similar analyses, and it's kind of obvious, but in the DRC we find that degradation or deforestation is more along roads, it's closer to cities, um, closer to rivers, these things that are basically these human drivers. Um, but yeah, the next step is to take this uh, degradation map or take this areas that we know are degradation and analyze them with respect to other data that we have, such as infrastructure, logging concessions, mining, someone brought that up before, um, and then see if there's, um, if there's an impact there. Thank you. And the next question is, have you thought about relating the spatial patterns with information on drivers, which could be helpful to inform RED implementation? Yeah, so that's, I think, the same as the previous question. That's the next step. Um, very useful analysis, uh, like a literal, uh, actual spatial analysis of where we're seeing degradation relative to different land uses um, to see how those are driving degradation, indeed. Great, thank you. And then this will be our final question, and this is from Tom. Could a process like this be made to account for other factors, such as permanent conversion to palm oil plantations or temporary clearance for customary rotational farming, for instance? Yeah, and so the same way, um, some of the projects we work on, we do look at conversion of forests to oil palm or to other uses. And so you could remove those from the forest cover map. Um, you basically, yeah, overlay what you know is an oil palm plantation. You basically make that non-forest in your map, and then you rerun um, the algorithm, and you'll find those edges. Basically, those forest edges that are on the edge of palm oil plantations are going to be more, you know, degraded than your intact forest or your core, and you can see how much core you've lost or how much uh, edges and so on. And you can look at the, how the pattern changes due to that conversion of forest. Thank you. And so I know we had a couple more questions, but we are out of time here. So um, thanks to everybody for joining us. Thank you so much to Orly. As you can see, there are some additional resources here. And as Orly mentioned, we will find a way to get you the link to the tools that she mentioned. And you can always keep in touch with us 
or get to Orly through um, this email address here. It will come to me and I can pass it along to her. And, um, and thanks again for joining us. This is a monthly session, so we'll have another one next month. Please keep your eyes out. And with that, I will bring us to a close and we will see you next time. Thank you again. Thanks, Orly. Bye.